Merci à tous d'être euh, là pour ce séminaire mensuel de idées. Aujourd'hui, on a le plaisir d'accueillir, je pense, Étienne et Marion. Je n'ai pas, pas vu Philippe dans les, dans les vignettes. Étienne et Marion euh, qui vont vous proposer, alors je crois, ce qui est plutôt un, un, un projet d'expérimentation. Euh, donc vous allez nous, nous présenter le les grandes idées et le, et le design. Voilà, ben je vous laisse la parole tout de suite. OK. Et la présentation, c'est possible de la de présenter en anglais ou... Bien sûr, oui, oui, bien sûr. OK. OK. So, hi, everyone. So, I'm really glad to be here to present this work. So, um, thanks for having me here. It's a, so, it's a joint work with uh, Marion Monet, which is here, and uh, Philippe Collot, which is uh, not present today. So basically, this project starts starts um, a year ago when I discovered the amazing job market paper from Marion and to understand how teachers interact with students. And we we're wondering whether we could bring some um, experimental insight from, from this since I have like a behavioral economics background. So I was just wondering whether we could introduce a behavioral approach to understand why do teachers develop uh, gender behaviors. So um, basically, we just passed the ethical committee a month ago, so it was a really good news. And uh, it's a really work in progress plenary, this plan. So any com comment, any suggestions, or any like um, feedback are really useful for, for the three of us. And I forgot to introduce myself. So I'm a postdoc at INED. So Philippe Collot is a postdoc at uh, ETH, and Marion Monet is an assistant professor at uh, IREDU. So basically, we start the, with the basic fact that, um, based on the paper from uh, from Terrier, so on the fact that there is a grading bias uh, between uh, regarding the gender of uh, of pupils. So, so for instance, we observe that. Um, yeah, is it fine? Yeah. So we observe that boys, like when there is, like uh, basically she compares a blind score and a non-blind score in literacy and math among um, middle school students to understand whether teachers tend to have like a grading gender bias uh, towards their pupils. And what they find is like, there is a substantial bias against boy in math, where they do not observe any, um, any bias in, uh, in literacy. So this is the first move, like this first hint, because basically we can understand that teachers tend to have like different grading system depending on the pupil's gender. And then we, based on like another fact on the uh, paper from uh, Pauline Charousset and Marion Monet, we like who who analyzed based on the school transcript, like they analyzed whether teachers had developed different vocabulary to talk uh, to interact with the students. So basically, you can see the odd ratio uh, of every single, uh, like the 10 best gender predictors used by math teachers uh, towards the, um, the students. So basically, you can see on the left panel, the females relative to male, and on the right panel, males relative to female. So for instance, the first, like the best predictive uh, words and adjective for, for females is a uh, lack of confidence, the second is smiling, but for boys having fun or being curious. So basically you can go like all over like the 10 different predictors, you can see like there's like really different vocabulary pattern between, uh, between regarding the gender of, uh, of pupils. So based on these two facts, we're just wondering, okay, like, can we understand why do teachers develop like such a distinct pattern of, uh, of feedback towards the, the, the students? So basically our motivation here is to understand why do we develop gender behaviors? So um, there is a growing body of evidence suggesting that teachers have like a gender behaviors, meaning that they behave differently, whether the teachers are girls or boys. And here we aim to analyze whether, so do we observe such a pattern in a, in a control environment? And can, how can we explain these behaviors? So for instance, is it due to beliefs in the ability of the students? Or is it, or it, is, it could be analyzed as a discriminatory, discriminatory pattern. So for instance, like you have a really strong gender identity, so you tend to favor your own gender, and then you develop different uh, behaviors uh, with pupils. So more specifically, we focus on teachers. So it's a really relevant pool to investigate gender behaviors. Like the first reason is that they formalize their beliefs on gender. So what do we mean by that? Is, is the fact that like human resources or, or managers and so on, they interact with peoples. And 
the point with teacher is that interacting like many different ways and each of them like formalize their beliefs on gender. So for instance, they had to grade students, they had to write, uh, to provide written feedback to the students and they daily interact with students. So basically we can imagine that this kind of beliefs from teachers have a long lasting effect on students would outcome. And basically a specific, um, what is really interesting with teachers is like, as I mentioned earlier, they, they develop like really different form of feedback. So it could be written, oral, and even in the written, there is a huge heterogeneity in the form that you could take. And so basically here, what, you, what we aim to do is to, answer, to compare what we observe with administrative, administrative data and the previous evidence from the literature as the paper, like the two earlier papers that I mentioned. Like such data allows to have a really precise measure of the estimates and like uh, to document a really precise fact. While it, it, it's really hard to understand like the decision making of teachers and why they develop different behaviors. So the point of experiments in, on that matter is like we can really set up a really controlled environment where we can distinguish every single dimension of the decision making process. And such uh, approach around uh, us a really strong internal validity because we can control every single uh, component that may, that may influence the teacher's decision making. And more importantly, like compared to administrative data, we can really elicit different mechanisms which may be at play to, to investigate gender behaviors. And so the fact that we focus on like documenting the mecha mechanisms that might be at play, it's like have like so, somehow like large policy implication since we are focusing mainly on gender identity and beliefs. And if we observe like whether like for instance, beliefs explain gender behaviors or identity, we do not, we would not implement the same policies. So for instance, if you observe that a teacher with very really strong gender identity interact differently with students, which are like boys and girls, it's very really hard to implement a given policy because it's very really hard to change the perception of a teacher identity. While if we observe that it is some beliefs, we can easily correct the fact that teachers might have like um, biased beliefs on a, a gender identity. So basically this approach relates to like three stands of the literature. So the first one is uh, the like gender behaviors or more, broad, or more broadly discrimination. So this is go on a, like really like um, quite old literature from uh, like Becker on whether peop uh, people different a taste or a statistical based discrimination. So the uh, underlying idea is like the taste is the fact that uh, you you appreciate working with someone which is similar to you. And statistical is like you you um, you develop discriminate the behaviors because based on statistics you observe different pattern between genders. And here, so we we are like uh, developing um, a theoretical model and more specifically Philip, and to analyze whether it could be due to consequentialist or Unitarian approach to this. We won't we won't go in details today about it, but uh, I would be glad to discuss more in detail afterwards. And more specifically, once we 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 summarize the literature on gender behaviors, which is like super, super wide. We focus more specifically on teacher feedback. So most of the evidence as the two papers that I mentioned earlier are focused on administrative data and they provide like robust evidence on the fact that teachers behave differently regarding the gender of the students. And also that uh, we, that this gender behavior has really significant uh, um, impact on the path, like the academic tracks that the people are choosing, the school achievement and so on. So as I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to understand why teachers behave differently. So with administrative data, it's really easy to, to, like, to compute like teacher value added or like whatever measures that we can have, but it's really hard to understand why like precisely they behave differently and like how can we address this decision-making process. And so here, what we are doing is like based on a fixture tax, we can elicit their implicit bias and incentivize their measure of identity, which is like cross validated by the behavioral literatures. And so our main aim is to like find, the, like um, confirm the analysis which are uh, found on administrative data and whether we can explain those results based on the behavioral approach. 
And last, third and last, so um, we also speak to the literature related to beha uh, behavioral approach of education, where like there is a large body of evidence suggesting that students' behaviors shape shape educational achievement. So, for instance, uh, pupils which are patients or, or risk uh, loving are more likely to have higher grades and so on. But little is known that matter and how like this behavioral approach does influence students and teacher interaction. So based on these three literatures, what we are doing, we have like two main research questions. So the first one is to understand whether students' gender cause teachers to behave differently. And if so, is it driven by identity or beliefs? So what we are doing here, so we plan to hire teachers from um, um, secondary education through an online experiment. So the online experiments is really offer like a, a large amount of benefits because we can like a, really provide a control environment and to distinguish like every single component of the decision making of teachers. And so the main task would be to assess um, uh, grades on school scholarship with variation within the information available. So basically what we are doing, so we would just like show a, like a school transcript with a, like a given school performance and we just like change the name of um, of the pupils which are which have the school transcript. So basically it's really similar to what we observe with the testing literature, but like what we are doing is like we replicate this approach among school transcripts. And so more importantly, what we are doing, so we we account for like two different approach of um, like two behavioral components of teachers. So the first one is to elicit beliefs on uh, gender ab ab ability through the implicit association task. And second, we we analyze the prevalence of gender identity through a um, um, detector of the game. So both approach offers a convenience that it's like widely used in the literature. And then we can like provide like insight on why teachers behave differently regarding the gender of students. So basically, hey, can... yep. Yeah, can I ask something? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder, so that, that I mean, that, that sounds great. I, I wonder whether you could also use that to actually then do an intervention, which would be tell the teachers how much they're biased once you've measured it. Yeah, true. So, so there is some like uh, that's a very really good point. Um, so basically, our first aim was just to show like, okay, do we like is it like do we observe that there is like a gender sure. behaviors, and if if so, sure. can we understand yeah. mechanism? And actually, there is evidence from the literature that uh, you know if you if you know, I inform you how much you're biased, it's very really likely that people change their behaviors. But so far, we haven't thought about it. But uh, that's uh, that's a really good point. Okay. Uh, the other point is, um, uh, Mario is no, I, I'm sure what I'm going to say. But the other point is, uh, you could also do like take the opportunity to do the same thing for uh, social discrimination, right? Not only gender discrimination. It's a whole different literature, of course. But I mean, it's a, it's exactly the same idea. And I yeah. guess it it wouldn't like you just you would just need a a bit of a bigger sample basically maybe not even bigger sample because you could you could split it's not even clear that you would need a bigger sample i think so maybe i think that that would be that would be great um, of yeah. course it's much more difficult than the changing name part uh you know what it, what exactly would you do in terms of names uh but uh, i think that it will be worth thinking about it since you're doing it you know yeah, so that's a really, really good point. So at the beginning, we are like really enthusiastic to like uh, to like to go more on like a broader aspect of discrimination between the teachers and students. But the point is like we so we have I will go more in details in the for um, analysis. But we plan to like conduct several later urgency analysis, and that's like I'm not we are not sure that our super size will be enough. Because we like, I would go more in detail afterwards. But we plan to pay participants to have like a, to elicit the gender identity, and so we have like a budget constraints to hire teachers. So um, sure, to... if you do, if you do like, um, you if you do heterogeneity, then you need a bigger sample. If you don't do heterogeneity, but if you do gender on one side and then social discrimination on the other side, then you do not need a bigger sample. I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah, no, no definitely. Definitely. So but, just, uh, like, we can talk uh, about it later. 
Yeah, for sure. But like, thanks. That's really great inputs. Um, so like, I will go more in details with the power calculation and so on. But uh, that's a really good point. So any questions so far? No? Okay, so if I like jump to the experimental design and or hypothesis, so let's look at a bit at the like the protocols that we have. So basically, our experiments consist in like three blocks. So the first block is about like uh, like the gender teaching practices. The second one is about like implicit gender bias, and the third one is about gender identity. So since we are really interested to have like an unbiased measure of gender teaching practices, we will just have the block one, which is always the first block that the teacher will have to do. So basically they will have to evaluate school transcripts with like different uh, criteria that I will detail afterwards. Then the order between the block two and the block, th block three is random. So whether they would play first the implicit gender bias or the gender identity. And so, like, uh, basically, the implicit gender bias is uh, based on the implicit association test, which aim to compare behaviors of teacher, whether between like a stereotypical, st stereotypical and quarter stereotypical uh, associations. And third, so like this the third block on gender identity. So basically, we will use like several dictator games in random order within this block where we have like a no identity, um, placebo identity, so colors, and the revealed identity genders. And so last, so they will, uh, like teacher will fill a survey at the end of the experiments, like to uh, have like basic demographics and teaching, uh, declared teaching, teaching practices and, and so on. So, so the first block is, uh, so like, I guess like every people which has been to the French system knows is kind of, uh, of a school transcript, it's like a really a usual task that teachers are doing, and like it's really the same form in like most of the like uh, schools in France. So basically, here you can see so it's a bulletin of uh, Manon. So like this, this is the only information that will change between the school transcript. So we'll use the most common names uh, in in France to compare. So Manon and Martin, and then we can like compare. Like this is the only component that will change. Uh, among uh, school transcript. So basically, we are not sure about like having this, um, uh, like the number of uh, late arrivals and school out uh, days. And then after we plan, so we have like six different uh, fields. So French, math, biology, English, history, and uh, like the average grades, where we have like the average uh, grades that the students have and the class average. And then we can we can also like change the school performance of pupils between the school uh, transcript. So just just one thing, there's there's one thing that um, I mean, of course, you're going to control for in your experiment, but there's one thing in real life, which is different from that, which is the fact that teachers actually take into account pupils behavior when they grade students and when they comment on like how students are right. Yeah. And like the literature tells us that behavior is like dramatically different between girls and boys so um i think there's something to do about that which is you know there the the statistical discrimination is going to be uh probably big on on that point i don't know um i i guess that's worth like uh thinking carefully about uh, about it sorry in advance to that i haven't understood yet what is the task you ask teachers Yes, so basically, like they will have like this information, and after they will have to say, uh, like this is the next slide. So um, I will just. There, there is no information here except for 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 the name of the person. No, no, no. So we just so like they have to invent point. grades for that person. Or what is yeah. the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, we just like uh, fill the transcript with uh, with grades. And the only information that will uh, change is like the grades that people have and the name. Oh. Then we can compare school uh, within school transcript. So you provide the grades. Yeah. The teachers. So what, yeah, do the teachers, like, what do the teachers have to do? I'm sorry, it's not, it's not, it's not clear to me. What do the yeah. teachers have to do then? So basically, like here on this slide, we oh, okay. we precise like the two feedbacks that we consider. So like the first part that I show is uh, mainly about um, like the what the information that we provide to them. Okay. And then they have like to answer like two uh, different feedbacks. So the first one is like the distinction ranging from the lowest, so worrisome record to the highest excellence. So this is like a neutral distinction. Okay. 
And then we have a second one when it's uh, over assessment among four options, which reflect like different views of anti agent from innate to like with like the fixed mindset feedback to acquired, so a gross mindset feedback. Okay, sorry, just so so I, I have to go. I'm very, I'm very sorry, but just just to say here the the I think here so you have a risk right, which is that nothing shows up because yeah. the discrimination actually comes from how they interpret the behavior, and when you show great, maybe they're not going to discriminate, while in real life they do, right? Yeah. So maybe you want to add something about behavior on this transcript because that's actually the key input that they're also using, and prob most probably what they're discriminated against then it's a question of whether they they are right to take into account behavior or not uh, that's a question per se uh, but um yeah i think it's you know in my it might be worth thinking about something else because it might be that here you don't find anything maybe you will uh, but um to be safe but, maybe you want to add something with behavior in between i would say but they, they do provide uh days of absences right yeah this this was the idea to to uh complete etienne's answer this was the idea behind nombre de retard and nombre de jours d'absence uh so there is a trade-off between providing a lot of detailed information and uh and some at what of, age is it uh high school students high school students oh okay yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, like, like the whole point is, um, like uh, we have like a really um, intense trade-off, like, and uh, we have like really heavy chat about it because, like, we have like a really trade-off between like how much we want to detail like this, um, the teacher feedback and the different school transcripts that they ha said have to evaluate, and the power analysis that we will to conduct because. The more we add information, and the less we will be able to like conduct the intelligence analysis and so on. So that's a really a trade-off that we are facing. And so clear, since we haven't like finished all the power analysis, we haven't like um, cut it out. But we have um, to think about it because definitely we can have like providing the information on uh, like short absence and so on are like really important for um, for like the discriminations that teachers are, are having. So, is there some question left on the um, on the the first uh, block? Are we clear? Okay, I think we're clear. So, basically, what we aim like with this first block is just to show that to provide a really design like a, a really a settings which is really similar to like the daily tasks that they are doing. So, like really close to the real world things. So. I believe like like we believe like with this approach is like pretty similar to what they have to do like in their daily tasks. So then if we jump to the block two, which aim to answer the implicit gender biases, it's um, so we, we use like really cross validated measures, which is like the implicit association test. So it measures the implicit beliefs on gender ability rather than the explicit one through the actual behaviors. So that's really important. Like you can have like a lot of measurement issue if you ask uh, teachers what they believe on genders. And the good point of the implicit association test is that you compare the actual behaviors. You do not ask them, but you can measure their behaviors. And so basically, it exploits the time uh, like the teachers make between counter stereotypical association relative to the stereotypical ones. So, for instance, female in science and female literatures, and then or measures is uh, like uh, the time that they that they that they make to that they take to make the, the choices. So basically here I just like display the, um, the different steps. So like you have like two training stage. So here you have like masculine and feminine that you have to like, like the word in the middle, you have to say whether it's masculine or feminine. Then you have like a second stage, which is the same between uh, literatures and science. So you have some arts and you have to do the same stage. And then on major interest, interest starts when you have like masculine and literatures and feminine and science and you have to do the same um the same choice and so basically so you have like uh, five different uh, five different stage with uh, that we measure and we take like the average times that people are the teachers are making for making to um, make the association so even if it's like really used in the literature, there is a lot of discussion about it. So like there is a lot of pros and cons of using it because like a really pro, a really strong pro is like it overcomes the traditional limitation of cell declared beds. And it's more specifically, it's really nice because it's really unlikely that teacher have been previously exposed to a similar task. 
but also it has been like really used in like uh, several um, well published paper to show like uh, you know um, the MPC assertion test has an external validity for teachers, so that's very really useful. And th so the cons is about the fact that uh, you know it might capture unstable characteristics that vary over time, and it, it made more reflect some cultural stereotype rather than personal attitudes toward genders. So now we focus on uh, on the, the the third block on measuring gender identity. So um, basically, what we are doing is really stand out in the experimental literature is just to focus as identity as the in group preferences that we measure through the dictator game. So just to introduce really briefly the dictator game. So it's uh, about how much you share of your initial endowment to uh, total strangers. So this is um, like the baseline uh, settings. So after the ideas, just to say, okay, what about if we add, I do like a really fake identity. So for instance, if you're red and green, and so you can, you have to share your endowment with a, with another person. And then you have a third stage where you say, okay, so you are a girl, you, know, you are a woman and you play with a woman or you are a, ma a male and you play with a male. And so basically what we plan to do is like to compare the behaviors into these three different treatment in a way to understand like the sensitivity of uh, one identity on, ident on uh, one te of teachers on identity and uh, more specifically that sensitivity to the gender identity. And so what is really useful, so it's a task which is like really used in the, in the lab to understand like uh, how people change their behaviors when we give them the identity, but it also have like a substantial external validity. For instance, demands show like uh, it's related with political behaviors and so on. So what we do precisely, so here as like, so you, you have like the five different dictator games that they are playing. So the first one is the baseline, when they, are, when they play with a random partner, and then you have like two different settings. So we basically, teachers will randomly play whether the baseline, whether the placebo, whether the gender first, and like all the, the dictator game order is randomized. So once we we have the baseline, we can we have the second stage with a placebo with a placebo identity. So basically, they will have like to make two dictator games. One when it's wood group, so where they will play with someone with with the same placebo identity, and odd group with someone which is uh, out of the group. And so basically, what we measure of um, so this placebo identity, it's uh, just about uh, giving assigning a color to the teachers and how they behave. And so the third one is like super standard as you, as I guess you, you realize, like uh, just to give identity to like information on player's identity. And so basically we can, we can just say, okay, so you're a woman and you play with a woman or you're a woman and you play with a, with a male and it's the same for the odd group behaviors. And so out of this, we are able to capture like two measures. So the first one is about like a sensitivity to identity. So basically it's comparing the in-group placebo identity to the baseline. Then you have to, you can measure how much an individual change his behaviors when we assign him an identity. And second, and more importantly, we can have like a really nice measure of gender identity or more specifically the sensitivity of teachers' gender identity. And so basically we just compare like the gender identity in group behaviors and we compare it with the placebo, placebo identity in group behaviors. And we believe that these measures provide a really nice outcome for, um, for measuring the sensitivity to, uh, to teacher's identity. I have two questions. So are yep. they with real people and uh, how are they incentivized? Yeah, so um, like that's uh, like a, that's a that's a really good point. That I will detail more in. I will provide more detail afterward. But that's real teachers who will play it, and they will be incentivized in the, like monetary speaking, and like they will play with the players which are like a specific subject pools that I will detail afterwards. So, um, so how does it look like precisely? So um, here it's like the baseline uh, game. So you have, a, okay, so this is a sharing game and you will play with a volunteering from a, from a, organiz a organization, which is randomly um, draw. So you don't have any information that person, how much of these 50 coins would you, would you share with this one? So, and then he, he click on the blue bar and he has to show what's the, what's the share of on the month that he shares. So 
the, the second one, so here's the placebo identity. So you see like uh, you are uh, uh, red colors and you play with a, with a volunteer from the organization AFEV, which is also red. How much would you, would you give to him? Then you have the odd group placebo measures, which is like, okay, so you are red and you play with green. And then you have uh, the gender the gender one, which is like, okay, so you play with another um, um, volunteer from the organization, AFEV, and he's a male. Uh, how much would you, would you share with him? So it's not polished right now, so we have to make something which is uh, more in detail, like more gentle on the way that we introduce the identity, because like this is way too straightforward and uh, it could really bias the um, teachers, but that's the main idea. And so... Basically, and after you say, okay, so you play with a female uh, um, volunteer from the AFEV, and how much would you give to her? So basically, this is really, really nice because we have like these different measures of identity, and we have like a really, we can measure precisely how much teacher is sensitive to the to the gender identity and to the to a placebo identity. So then the survey. Yeah. So can I ask a question, Etienne? Yeah, for um, sure. I'm not sure I understand why you have this uh, measure of gender identity bias, where you uh, subtract the uh, placebo uh, identity. I mean, if you are uh, if you are as sensible sensitive to uh, colors than to gender, then you have no gender sensitivity to gender identity in your measure. Um, yeah. Although, I mean, it's not, you are, you are sensitive to gender and uh, you are as much sensitive to colors. Uh, so it does not make sense to me that you are not, uh, that your sensitivity will, will be zero in that case. Yeah. And it's, it's not, and it's not very clear why you should be sensitive to color in the first place. Yeah. It seems very artificial, but maybe there's literature that it, that it, something happens there, but it seems yeah. to me. True, so that's really artificial, but it, people really change their behaviors uh, uh -huh, when okay. they are assigned to like a really placebo colors. And so okay. like normally it's meaningless, but actually they change. So what, why, so to answer more, more in details about your, your question, I think it's uh, Elise. Um, so the idea was just like most of the paper just focus on like comparing the baseline that we have with the gender identity. But actually, there is like a two different components in those measures. So there is like the fact that you are sensitive to the notion of identity and whether it's like specific and more specifically, whether like your gender identity is something central in for you. Yeah, but in re no, I understand that. But in real life, if you are sensitive to groups, where, where, will it be colors or gender? Uh, you are sensitive to any uh, characteristics. It means that if you are in a situation where you have to evaluate girls and boys, you will uh, be biased. I mean, it's not uh, it's not important that you are also sensitive to other things than gender. You you see in the real life behavior, it will have an incidence, and uh, that's what is important. Mm -hmm. Even if you are also sensitive to other things. In, yeah. In yeah, so, so that's why we consider like these two measures of like the uh, first one, which is a sensitivity to identity, which uh, which is like a, a first measures. And then we have like a, more specifically to the gender identity. But it's true that maybe it's just like a like a identity things and not like a specific to gender. So I don't know if it if it answer your point. No, I just, yeah, it, uh, I think that you should, uh, you, you may have uh, to take into account uh, uh, the gender in-group variable uh, itself without subtracting the placebo in-group variable, uh, because maybe you will uh, miss uh, important uh, um, sensitivity to gender identity if you use the, the, the difference between the, the two variables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Like a really good point. So is everything clear about like the detector game and the different treatments that we have? Yeah. Okay, so I will move forward. Um so then about the survey, so we, we plan first to ask like really basic teacher characteristics, so their age, the zip code, and like the subject of the discipline. So for instance, if our math teacher, biology teacher, and so on. And so this uh, first component would be more about like connecting the heterogeneity analysis. So for instance, like the literature 
shows that math teachers behave differently and and so on. So we plan to replicate these results uh, among our experimental design. And so the second is just to like measure some declared measures of uh, teaching practices. And so we build from um, Sule, Alan, and co um like a four dimension of teaching practices. So basically, they have modern versus, versus traditional teaching, growth versus fixed mindset, warm versus distance, extrinsic, extrin extrinsic versus intrinsic motivators. And so basically, this aim to show like how does it inter inter interrelated with a uh, with our first measure of interest. And the third one, so it's about like percep perception of gender. So it's declared again, and it's to ask about like uh, the gender perception in education and on the labor market. So it's just to see whether we recover our main, like, uh, the, our main measures based on the survey items. So basically just to like be like crystal clear about our experimental design. So we have like, so the main two variables so distinctions and over assessments are our main measures of uh, the teacher feedback. So the first one is a, a so like both of them are based on an assessment of fictitious transcript. And so the first one is a, a variables from one to seven between one being voicesome and seven being excellent. Over assessment is from one to four, the one reflecting strong fixed mindset and force is a strong growth mindset. Then we have the discourse based on the implicit association test and the different measure identities that we discussed earlier. So on our hypothesis, so like our two main hypotheses is, uh, so H, H1 is uh, for a given performance level, female students are overgraded relative to male. So that's a result with, which is somehow a standard in the, in the literature based on administrative data. And the second is just to, to analyze like whether we observe for a given performance level that female students receive more gross mindset feedback than male students. So this is like with our two measures of interest, whether we observe the results that are uh, coming out from uh, administrative data. And so what we aim in this, uh, in this project is just to analyze the mechanism behind these genders pedagogical practices. So H3 is uh, the one which is related to strong gender identity and the fact that it's associated with overgrading same gender students. So having in-group biases and giving different types of feedback to male and female students. So big, basically H3 is like a direct effect on identity on the grade of uh, teacher's feedback. And H4 is about is whether strong gender identity is associated with strong gender implicit biases. So on the, the fact that we observe that identities, so our measures in the dictator game are correlated with our measures of bias. And then like this may have an impact, uh, an indirect impact on identity on teacher's feedback. And fifth, so it's like strong, strong gender implicit biases is associated with giving more fixed mindset feedback. So, to go back to, to your question, Mark, so um, like teachers are really at a really particular subject pool and it's really not hard to hire, but uh, you have to make some effort to to uh, to recruit them. So participation is on a voluntary ba basis. And so we plan to, um, to, uh, to recruit teachers from various subjects and diverse geographical areas. So we do not aim to have like a representative sample of the teachers, but whether they have like a really having um, heterogeneity in our sample to conduct like the heterogeneity analysis that we plan to do. And so we plan to recruit them through two channels. So the first one is teacher union. So like a good point is like it allows to, to contact a large set of teachers, but it's very likely to be a selected samples. And the, the second channel, which is the more likely that will be, that will be used is the school inspectors, which are like really helpful that uh, since they can reach a large number of teachers from their discipline. And so we like we already are in touch with them, and so they plan to forward um, the participation to the survey uh, when we will be running it. Etienne, what, yep. what about Facebook? So Camille here will present in one month. She has a very nice paper where she recruited students on Facebook, and it worked fine. Yeah, like we do not, um, we haven't done it, and I think it could be hard to. Um, to fulfill the RGPD criteria with uh, hiring them uh, through Facebooks. Why? Why? I don't see why. No, I mean, was a joke. Didn't work okay, out. Okay, but, uh, okay. 
Uh, no, and we we ha like so. Marion has really great contact with the school in inspectors. So um, since right. we ha we have a limit of a uh, thousand teachers because uh, of budget constraints. So we we think like uh, school inspectors would be enough to reach uh, this number. Okay. So, um, but it's true that reaching them through a third, a third channels would be like really useful. But um, we plan to do it like mainly through the school inspectors. And so the point is, since we plan to measure like this uh, altruism identity thing, so it's really important that we pay teachers to to make them like uh, revealing their identity is costly. So we plan to incentive them to reveal their true preferences in the data game. So since we plan to have a survey around 20 minutes, so we we calculate the fact that um, like 10 euros could be like a good um, a good payment. And so to increase the stake, because 10 euros is not a lot for, for teachers, we plan to randomize the payment. So 10 persons has a chance of winning 100 euros in total. So 100 users in total means he, he like teachers has be, be, behaved selfishly in all the dictator games. So basically they can, uh, in the maximum, earn 100 euros. And so the second point that we take we take account for is that the fact that if we pay teachers, they would not be likely to reveal their preferences because they wouldn't appreciate to be like perceived as a, a subject from, from an experiment and so on. So they will, what we, we thought about and it's that they will be matched with uh, like volunteering from an organization, which is the uh, AFEV, which is which aim to provide tutoring to underprivileged uh, pupils. So we believe that this measure is like really useful because it's um, alleviated these possible biases of self-image concern of uh, teachers making money. And but also because it's really um, similar to the field settings that it, that we aim to measure. So basically, most of the AFEV is uh, like um, undergrad students who provide the tutoring to underprivileged people. So we think like teacher will be really receptive to um, to this uh, to this partner. And so basically, incentivize is really useful because we made it made it like really costly for teachers to reveal their identity. And overall, like all those aspects guarantees the fact that our relationship is really familiar, uh, similar to what it observed in the field. So then if we switch to the empirical approach, so basically we plan to like uh, use a uh, within transcript variation. So here we, we have YGT where, where Y is uh, two outcomes. So the distinction from the one to seven, and the assessment from one to four. So here we will randomly display the, uh, the gender, so whether female or male, and we have a school transcript fixed effect. And we cluster, we plan to cluster the standard error at the teacher level to avoid like um, uh, serial correlation. So our main analysis is to is a within school transcript, which is like uh, who might appear like pretty su surprising at the first glance. But um, most of the literature on the test on uh, the testing on testing sh shows that it's really like data demanding to have like a average human defect and at an individual level. So what we aim here is just to compare like uh, uh, between a uh, within school tra school tra tra transcript. Sorry. And so basically what we thought about is about uh, using the first transcript that the uh, teachers are, are shown since they are unbiased and just to um, have more information on the individual response. So like this is a really preliminary uh, poor analysis. So basically here you can see the sample size. So here we, we do sorry, not- so, Sorry, Etienne, I'm not sure I understood. Can you go back to- Yep. So what, what do you need? What, what do you mean exactly by within school transcript analysis? You mean analysis at the, at the school aggregate, but you don't have schools literally here. Do you You have teachers from everywhere? I'm, I'm not sure I got that. Oh, yes. Sorry. Maybe it's uh, it's a typo. So basically, we add the fixed effect at, uh, at the transcript. And so we can compare within school transcript whether the, uh, the fact that we display it, if it's a female or a male, lead to a different uh, feedback from the teachers. Oh, okay, it's a transcript. Oh, sorry, it's within transcript. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, but that's really like at the beginning, we're really hopeful to have like a really nice uh, within teacher variation, but uh, like we, 
like it will require to have teachers like um, evaluating hundreds of um, of uh, transcripts. So we thought like that's maybe way too much. <laughs> So basically here it's uh, like the power analysis. So here we do not like, uh, so it's a really preliminary draft. So basically here you have the sample size. So the sample size is the number of uh, teachers participating just once to the experiments. And here you have the statistical power. And then you have the treat, like the different treatment effects that we observe. So 0 0.1, 0 0.15 and 0 0.2 and the significant levels that we aim for. So basically with uh, um which like so this is like the 0 0.2 is 0 0.2 standard deviation so great bias so this could seems to be pretty huge but based on the literature it's uh, pretty standard and so what we see so if we have like 1000 participants we can we can observe uh, a statistical um a significant relationship uh, at the treatment effect at a 5% level if the, the treatment effect is 0 0.15 standard deviation so basically, we now we have to like have a bigger sample size because we plan to hire a thousand teachers. We will evaluate like six, six school transcript. So basically, we have like much more uh, statistical power. But so far, we haven't considered for within correlation uh, teachers. So what we plan to do? So as uh, Nina. I highlight earlier, we have like a trade-off between the information that we provide to teachers uh, on whether like as a school overall school performance and, and so on. So here we focus on like several heterogeneity analysis. So the first one is like considering the different type of transcripts. So if they are good, average or bad, the gender of the teacher, whether it's a female or a male, the discipline of the teacher, whether it's a science or art and literatures. And after like a comparing the position in the distribution in gender identity and gender implicit biases to understand whether there is some heterogeneity in there. So, and so this is like what we plan to pre-register And the second uh, step is to have more an explanatory heterogeneity. So it's a, uh, would be based on the declarative teaching practices. And we plan to conduct like a clustering analysis such as PCA and so on to analyze whether the average treatment effects that we obsess in the first stage can be replicated among different uh, different uh, teachers' profile that we measure through uh, the clustering analysis. And so a bit of the roadmap for the next month. So before summer break, it would be like a writing and polishing the analysis plan that we have to a lot of work to do. And second is running the pilot study with uh, trainee teachers. And so after the summer break, we plan to run the experiment in mid-September to increase the take up rate because if we send before summer, it's very likely that teacher will be over busy and won't take the time to answer. And it's to develop more in detail the theoretical model. So thanks. And if you have any question or feedback, uh, I would be really happy to hear it. Thank you very much, Etienne. And thank you, Marion, for... Uh taking care of the of the chat meanwhile um yes questions maybe you want to get back to some discussions uh, that happened over the chat or other questions uh, I, I have a question uh, mark yeah yeah so uh typically in uh, in uh, when it comes to measuring teacher biases in, in grading in correlational studies uh, researchers compare um, standardized uh, measures based on standardized tests with the grades of the teachers. And if there is uh, an effect of gender, they conclude there is uh, some kind of bias in uh, teachers' grading. Uh, and the assumption here is that uh, what teachers uh, grade and should grade is only the, the objective skills measured by the standardized test. Uh, while uh, I think many teachers would explicitly endorse the fact that they should and do grade also the efforts, the grit, the perseverance of students, their behavior in the classroom. And I think this brings us back to a comment made previously by, by Nina, that is to say, it would be very interesting in my view to manipulate randomly also um, teacher ab uh, student absences and delays uh, as an indicator of um, classroom behavior. Uh, because I would argue that there are indications of teacher bias if and only if 
beyond measure, there is also a, a gap net of uh, uh, classroom behavior of the teachers. And then it would be interesting to see if this correlates with the gender identities and, and the other variables that you have. Yeah, like, thanks, Carlo, for, for the feedback. Like, uh, we, are, we aren't sure so far if we we should really push into integrating this, uh, those measures on uh, and teacher feedback, but it's true that it's. I think it's pretty important for for teachers to have this information. So we have to check in more in details with Marion and Philippe on the power analysis and how much we can add this such information. But uh, like definitely, it's relevant to add to um, to our experimental setting. Yeah, I, I forgot to say, but I just wanted to add that if I had to choose between this dimension of heterogeneity and uh, student performance, I would argue that this is more relevant. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't see, I don't have the impression that you have so far at least very strong hypotheses about why there should be uh, strong gender uh, variations based on the levels of performance. And I think that on the other side, there is lots of literature on gender differences in efforts uh, and classroom participation. Yeah, okay. Just okay. Etienne, to, to understand the power issue in relation to that. So I, I, I'm not sure I understood. Do you have the same teacher? Grade yeah. several versions of the, of the of the transcript. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we plan to hire um, a thousand teachers, and um, and each of them would. Uh, so we plan to ask them to uh, to evaluate six six uh, school uh, transcripts. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of power issue in providing them more transcripts with more variants, except if they get bored and just stop doing the job that's that's the cost but otherwise yeah 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 so it's like um we we are, like we don't don't want to have like a survey which is too long so uh, so that's more the trade off that we have mm. so we can like add up a lot more of a transcript to to evaluate but then we are not sure that uh, all teachers will will fill up the the survey and after like uh, some things that we we might be afraid to is so if we uh, if we have like more and more school transcript it could in, in it could increase the biases of uh, of teachers since they will understand that we are mainly measuring gender issues and so they will adopt their behaviors with a uh, with the number of transcripts that they are evaluating can i ask another question Etienne? yeah for sure uh, so it's just a follow-up on carlos question uh comment on the on the possibility of on the existence of a grading bias. Um, so not only they uh, take into account the behavior, I mean, uh, for example, submitting the assignment on time is a part of the grade, because if you do not submit on time, you have a zero and, and boys are maybe more likely to have a zero for that reason or so, something like that. But also it's, it's I think there, uh, there is evidence that boys uh, so the behavior at the test uh, is also something that can explain the difference because boys are more competitive so they are they may be uh, uh, more uh, excited by the test uh, and not girls who uh, on the contrary uh, may feel uh, very bad in the case of competition or exam uh, with a high stake or whatever. So mm -hmm. in the end, my question is, uh, is there evidence of a gra gender grading bias uh, that is not based on the comparison between uh, uh, continuous assessment and a national exam or test scores? Is there evidence uh, through like randomization of uh, copies with name or something like that? Yeah, well, that's um, that's a really good point uh, about the grading bias. Like, I'm not so familiar with the literature, but I think like the the, the paper of Marion and Pauline shows that uh, even if like in in like a random evaluation, teachers tend to have like different um, feedback on the, to to students in the forms of the providing more fixed or gross mindset uh, issues. So maybe we will not observe the grading bias that you are mentioning. But maybe maybe we just observe like the second uh, pattern, like on the by um, gender behavior regarding whether it's a gross or fixed mindset. But maybe Marion has more insight on the on the grading on the grading bias uh, literature. 
Um, I, I think you're right, Elise, in the grading bias literature. Uh, I, I mean, at least as far as I'm aware of, I've never seen any paper evaluating it uh, in other ways than comparing, you know, the, the blind grade such as baccalaureate versus the continuous grade. Uh, I'm almost pretty sure that all the papers use this difference. Uh, and the, the only thing that uh, it's a bit closely related, uh, it's an experiment that I've heard of. They have different pieces of uh, codes. Um, like it's a bunch of developers, some are women, some are uh, males, and they have them evaluate by external evaluators uh, and see if there is, you know, when the, the piece of code is written by a male or a female, does it differ in terms of uh, the grade they receive? And here they don't compare it with the, you know, the, there is not the blind, non-blind difference. I think it's uh, Clementine Van Effenter is working on something like this. And um, Jan Feld, uh, he's been mentioned to me a few days ago. So this is the only thing that comes to my mind. Okay, thanks. Is there one last question? No? Okay, so I, I, I think we are, we are getting to the, to the end. Uh, Thank you very much, Etienne and Mario and, and everyone. I think I think it's nice to have a different kind of seminar where you present projects and experimental projects rather than actual papers. It's uh, I think I hope it's useful for you and, and it's very interesting to to see this this construction. Yeah. Uh, so thank you a lot. I want to say that in one month time we'll have a presentation by Camille Terrier who will present the paper I mentioned. But she recruited students on Facebook and she influenced their choices on Parcoursup. So it's, I think, quite, quite an impressive and smart paper. So I hope you'd like to hear how to change people's choices on Parcoursup. And, uh, and just to mention, on June 2, we have the full day seminar. And uh, the topic will be uh, tutoring students we'll have presentations on online experiments of tutoring during COVID. And we have Susanna Loeb who will present a huge program to work with school districts in promoting tutoring. And, and, and she'll explain how she interacts. So uh, thank you a lot, everyone. Goodbye. Yeah, thanks a lot. Goodbye. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Bye.